good. Hey, good evening, everyone. So today we'll be doing section 14.6 on direction of rotors and the gradient vector. We'll also get into section 14.7 on max and mins, which is neat. But this whole section deals with directional derivatives. So far, we've only done derivatives such as fx and fy. fx was only in the direction of the positive x-axis. fy only went in the direction of the positive y-axis. But how about getting a derivative in another direction? And so I doubt it. we just start with this problem. It's like one of the first problems out of the textbook. And they want us to estimate the directional derivative at Reno in the direction of Las Vegas. All right? And those numbers in there, when the 50s, those contours, those are temperatures. Those are the actual temperatures. And uh, we need to know the distance. I'm just going to pull this down, slide this down so you can see the scale. Everything was distance was in miles down there. So there's good. I'll leave that there so we can use that. So if we want to estimate the directional derivative, remember we're just going to estimate it. So the best we can do for contours is just to we're estimating a derivative, right? This is called a directional derivative because it's going in a particular direction. The best I can do here is change in the function, what was it, temperature? Over the change in the distance. That's all we can do in terms of estimating a directional derivative. But yeah, let's find the change in the temperatures and estimate the distance between them. But the wording on this problem, they said at Reno in the direction of Las Vegas. I didn't want you to get so caught up in, oh, i got to know the distance between Reno and Las Vegas. Remember the key is, just like we were doing the tables last section, we use the numbers as close as possible that we can at the point. So they said estimate the directional derivative at which city? At Reno. What's the closest contours we can use around Reno? Looks like we can use the 50, right? And the 60? If you want on that piece of paper, when it has this, just draw a line that goes from here down to Las Vegas. Feel free to draw a line, because right, that's the direction. We're going to go from here to here, but we're going to use these two numbers. So when I'm using my fingers right now, all you need to do then is along this straight line path, can you estimate that distance? If you need a slider ruler next to it, just to estimate what would that distance be. I'm going to take my fingers and go like this. Looks like that would be the distance between the 50 and the 60 towards Las Vegas along a straight line. All right, come down here. And I don't know, 0 to 50 miles, 60 miles, it looks like. So that's what I can use for my distance. 50 to 60 miles, I use 60. And what was the change in the temperature? It was 50 minus 60, right? Or 60 minus 50. Did the temperature increase or decrease as you go in that direction? It increased. So what's 60 minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit? It looks like, you know, and here's our estimation of the directional derivative. 10 degrees Fahrenheit per 60 miles. So it appears like the temperature is the directional derivative at Reno in the direction of Las Vegas is roughly 10 degrees Fahrenheit per 60 miles, right? It's increasing that much. And you can reduce that to what, what? One degree Fahrenheit per six miles traveled. That's direct derivative. But now we need a formula for this, right? <laughs> but that's what it is. It's just getting the rate of change. You're not just going, like before this section, we only went in the direction of the positive x-axis or in the direction of the positive y-axis. So, hey, I'll turn this off. We may come back to it in a bit just to see some cool things. Well, I'll turn that thing off. So I'll hit the light. And let's, we need a math formula behind this. So what's the math formula that we can use for all directional derivatives? This is neat, everyone. They use a vector made up of partial derivatives. So let's just say you had a function of x and y. Right? And gosh, I'll just use a simple x squared plus y squared. Here's your function. The directional derivative will be equal to some vector that's made up of the partial derivative. And all we have to do is put a dot product with some vector. I just want to give you an example. What is 
That partial is fx and fy here, that function. What's partial respect to x? 2x. 2x. Partial square. respect to y? 2y. Well, let's just see. What would happen, everyone, if I used right here? This is going to be called this vector here. There's a name for this vector. I'll put it on the board in a second. But this vector right here is called the, the directional vector. All right, it's the directional vector. So let's go back to last section. If we went in the direction of the positive x-axis, do you agree I could just make this a 1 and a 0? Do the dot product, what would you get? You would just get that fx times the 1 plus the fy times the 1. Zero. 0, so this would be gone, you just have the fx. And see, that would give you the direction, that would give you the rate of change, direction of rate, and direction of the positive x-axis. Of course, what if I use what? A 0 here and a 1, that would give you the rate of change in which direction? So this would go away. If you dot that, you get fy, right? In the direction of the positive y-axis. Cool. But what's so great about this is, this is our math formula. We can do this in any direction. It doesn't have to be 1, 0, or 0, 1. It can be like 1, 1, right? But the key is, this does have to be a unit vector. So I'm going to write down the actual formula right now. This direct vector right here, they call it the unit directional vector. It must be a unit vector. This vector here that's made up of these partial derivatives is called the gradient vector. All right, so that's our math formula. This is the notation for a directional derivative. This is the notation for it. Directional derivative will always be equal to you know, like D with the subscript of U. The subscript of U is there because we always use what kind of directional vector? A unit directional vector. So that's why it has that funny little U there. But that's the notation for directional derivative. This thing right here is called the gradient vector. We take the dot product with the unit directional vector. And they have to tell you which direction we go. And we'll put that right here. We'll just make sure it's a unit vector. So I'll put it again like this. There's a cool math symbol for gradient vector. It's called G R A D F. That's the notation for the gradient of a function. So the gradient vector, it's a vector, but it's the gradient of the function f. What's its definition? It's made up of all the partial derivatives. So we can go up to the side here and leave this up all class. You know, what's G, R, A, D, and F equal to? It's made up of just what? All the partial derivatives. Heck, I'll even do an F, Z in section, in case it has what? Variables X, Y, and Z. It can have three dimensions to it. Cool. There's another notation for it. I use this the most. It's also del F. That symbol's called del F, so I'm going to put that here too. That's del. D E L. We just call that del. So I'll, I'll refer to del f. When I'm saying del f, I'm talking about the gradient vector. But G R A D F, grad f, is also the gradient vector. Gradient of f, gradient of the function. They give you some function. We get the partial derivatives, and you can find out what that vector is. Cool. This is huge, everyone. Even at the end of our course, you'll still be doing this. There'll be some neat stuff in chapter 16 where you'll get this. They'll give you the gradient vector. They'll want you to go back and figure out what this is. And of course, that'll involve integrals, won't it? That'll involve integrals, exactly. So that's what'll happen at the end of our course. So this gradient vector is neat. We take the dot product of the unit vector. So here we go. I'm going to ask you a question. Can you find the directional derivative of this function right here at the point how about 1, comma 2? And everyone, I want you to do it in the direction of this vector. 3, 4. So can you find the direction of derivative of that function at the point 1, comma 2 in the direction 3, comma 4? All right. So there's that fx. There's that y. What y plug into the x and the y? So it's really a substitute at that value. So it's del f evaluated at the point x not y not dot unit vector. There's your math formula. It's del f dot u. Looks like a curse word, right? F u. <laughs> I know. 
but that's an easy way to remember it. Del F dot U. This is the gradient factor dot the unit vector. So, but that's not a unit vector. So, anybody know a unit vector in a dark about three, four? Yeah, it should be the magnitude. And then I got divided. Divided. Divide it, yeah. So you divide out the magnitude from this, and I'll have a unit vector, right? Yeah. What's the square root of three squared plus four squared? Five. There you go. Now, if it came out to the square root of 13, I'm going to divide by the square root of 13. That sometimes happens. This came out to be a perfect square. Square root of 3 squared plus 4 squared, 5. That's a unit vector. So just be careful. With it. Make sure you always use a unit directional vector. I'll plug in a 1 and a 2. Let's see what we get here. What is 2 times 1, 2 times 2, and then dot with a 3 fifths and a 4. Alright, what do you get? This will be the directional derivative. 2 times 3 fifths is 6 fifths plus 4 times 4 fifths is 16 fifths gives me which is a rate. Rate to change. Also, do you have also a slope right in that direction. Okay. Oh, 22. Thank you so much. 6 and 16, 22. Thank you very much. So, so is, is directional derivative a vector or just a scalar? Directional derivative is a scalar. Always a scalar. It means derivative. Always think of that word derivative. Okay. This right here, think it is a derivative. And a derivative is a slope or a rate of change, so it has to be scalar. But the formula involved two vectors. vectors yeah. One of the vectors is called the, the gradient vector. And we take the dot product of the gradient vector with the unit okay. directional vector. And this is the vector, vector that they give you the direction. Oh, yeah, all, all dot products are scalar, I remember. Oh, good. Yeah. He goes, hey, all dot products are scalar. Is that my good, okay with that one? All right. Hey, um, this gradient factor, I want to stop and talk about that because it's really interesting. We'll leave some notes on it. And then we'll do a couple more problems where we find directional derivatives. Sound good? We're going to do it off like a hill. I'll give you a hill problem. It'll be cool. But can we just take a moment to talk about this cool gradient factor? All right. What do we know about the gradient factor? First of all, it's always perpendicular at the point. That's the first one I know about the gradient vector. The gradient vector will always be perpendicular at the point of tangency. It'll always go in the direction it points in the direction of, and I'm referring to. I'm, I'm referring to contour level curves. It always points in the direction of the increasing k values on a contour curve where the k values are like the z values, right? Okay. Well, can we get an idea of this? The best way to see this, I'm going to explore this, is just looking at an applet. So I'll turn it back on. Just so you can see this, I'm, pull up an, I'm just going to pull up a nice applet that has the gradient vector on there and everything. See? Just an image that can show us like the gradient vector. All right, mathinsight.org. Let me see if I can slide this stuff around. Okay, that comes in. I'm just going to slide this thing around here. Let me just pull this down a little bit. Is that showing up? So at that point, do you see this red vector right here? That is red. Do you notice it's perpendicular at that point of tangency off the level curve? But here's the three-dimensional you know, image of this mountain. 
but I can actually slide this thing around. But you'll notice, no matter what, when I calculate directional derivatives by this formula, and when you can watch this change right here, that right here gives you the directional derivative, and you can watch it change. I'll just swing it around, but watch the gradient vector will always remain perpendicular at the point of tangency, no matter what. So if I slide this around like this, I can do that. If I can move this, but does that red vector change at that point? That red vector is the gradient vector. This other color, I'm colorblind. What color is that? Green? Is it green? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But that's the directional vector. And so what'll happen is when you do that, you know you can find the direction root in that direction. So here, I, I noticed this would be going uphill, this would be a positive now, right? You slide around here, and now it's gonna be coming a negative value. Do you agree? Let me see if I can get the can I get the direction derivative to be zero? I want to watch that right corner. Can I get to be close to zero or so? There it's at one. Maybe I'll swing it even more. No? Somewhere around, uh, right around there. Uh, somewhere around right there when you can see that the rate of change, the slope would be what? Zero. So if someone walked in, was standing on this hill and walked in this direction, they're saying the slope would come out to be approximately zero. Where it was really steep the other way. Most important to me that you saw that red vector just sitting there. That red vector is the what? That's the gradient vector. Right? It was just taking the dot product of those two vectors. The gradient vector is always perpendicular at the point in tangency, whatever point they pick. But what way does it point? Because you're like a vector, you mean point this way or that way. It'll always point in the direction of the increasing, increasing k values, which the increasing k values is the value such that these are going uphill. Cool? So that's why this is pointed this way and not that way. Is that all right, Dad? Yeah, we'll work some problems. Um, turn that off. I'll hit the light. Hey, I want to draw an image now. I think I've got one of these. I got in the practice set. You know, I'm going to be at something like this. And you take the gradient right there. This is like, let's say this was k value equals 2. This is k value equal to 5. This is k value equal to 7. Um, you need to draw the gradient right here. Which way would the gradient point? That way or that way? So we just we continue this contour here like that. Okay. You got to draw the gradient at that point. Just to estimate the direction. Is it going that way or this way? Points in the direction of the increasing k values would go that way. Now, what would it look like? It would have to be perpendicular at this point, so I'm just going to draw a tangent line, would go what? Something like that. Don't worry about its length right now. Don't worry about its length. But that's which way the gradient. So I'm going to label this what? Del F? There's del F. It would be perpendicular and it goes in the direction of the increasing gate values. Cool. So hey, is everyone comfortable with that? Like even on a test if I said, hey, draw a gradient factor. Just so you know how long to draw it, I may say, like, draw a, a gradient vector that has a length of 1, which would be a unit vector. So I would say, draw a unit vector in the direction of the gradient vector. But make sure you draw it which way? It's perpendicular at the point of tangency, but it goes in the direction of the increasing k value. Does everyone know that? All right. Yeah, I'll leave that up here. So now... I want to, I'm going to pull a problem out of this book that we'll do in a second. I want to talk more about this formula here. Can we prove this? The max. Let me do a little proof. What would be the maximum value of the directional derivative? Like an easier way to figure it out. That would be the maximum rate of change, the maximum what, slope? That would see me swinging it around all different directions at that point. What would give me the maximum value of this directional group? So to prove this, everyone, I'm going to use an old theorem we had in this course. See how this is a dot product? I'm going to use this crux move, this theorem right here. What's A dot B equal to? Do you remember? Mm -hmm. Magnitude of A. Magnitude of B. Cosine theta, right? Cosine theta. So I'm going to use that in our proof. I'll just leave that off to the side. Well, let me start out with directional derivative. This is the formula for directional derivative. It's equal to, sounds like a curse word, del f dot what? Unit vector, right? <laughs> del f dot u. This is a vector, 
this is a vector, the dot product. Well, let me write it with that. So this is equal to the magnitude of delta. The magnitude of the unit vector times the cosine of the angle theta, where theta is the angle between the two vectors, right? We're almost done figuring this out. What are you going to do? What would always give me the maximum value of the direction of the rotor? Let's talk about cosine. What's the highest cosine it gets to? Zero, one. One. Everyone agree? What's the maximum value of cosine of theta? One. So we can turn this into a one. A one. What's the magnitude of any unit factor? One. One. And here it is. And we're just going to make it our own. Bless you. Separate theorem. We'll leave this up all class. The maximum value of a directional derivative will always just turn into the magnitude of the gradient vector. Isn't that cool? So I'll just put it out over here, right here. Max value of directional derivative, any directional derivative, will equal the magnitude of the gradient factor, well, evaluate at the point, whatever point you're at. If it's at the point 1, 2, plug in a 1 and a 2 in there. Isn't that cool? We just proved it. Because this has to be a 1. This is always a 1. It turns into the magnitude of the gradient factor. So if you see those problems on the practice set, you know, what is the maximum? They might word it as the maximum rate of change, right? What's the maximum rate of change if they write that? Just get the gradient factor and take its magnitude and plug in the point. Then we'll do one of those. So on that note, everyone, I'm going to pick up problems in the textbook. This is in section 14.6. I'll tell you which problem I'm picking. This is number 33 on page 944. I mean, it's got a part A and a part B and a part C. Part A. Well, V of X, Y, Z. Suppose that over a certain region of space, the electric potential, V, is given by 5X squared minus 3XY plus XYZ. This is called the electric potential over a certain region of space. Letter A. Find the rate of change. Time. That's what was happening there. 
rate of change, rate of change in the direction of a vector. So that way you're never confused between what's chain rule problem and what's a directional derivative problem. See, directional derivative problem, they've got to give you a vector. <laughs> they've got to give you a direction. 14.5 chain rule, rate of change, and it's just with respect to time. Right? Cool. All right. So I'm going to start it up. Here it is. I'm getting a directional derivative. Del f dot u. And then I'll plug in the points. So i got to leave enough room for this del f. So here comes del f, because it looks like del a. What's the partial rate with respect to x? I think that's enough room. What's the partial rate with respect to y? That's enough room. And then what's the partial rate with respect to z? We're going to fill all these in. Oh, they're v's. So I'll write this as v sub x, v sub y, v sub z. These are the partial rates of v with respect to x, with respect to y, with respect to z. That's what the gradient is. That's what the gradient vector is. It's defined as a vector made up of all those partial derivatives of v. So, what's your respect to x? See, we're always doing partial derivatives from here on out. What's that to respect to x? 10x. Anything else? Minus 3y. Minus 3y. Anything else? Plus y. Plus y. So I barely had enough room. All right. <laughs> What's vy? What's partial derivative with respect to y? Negative 3x. Negative 3x plus xz. And respect to z. Just x1? x1. And when eventually we will plug in a point three four five. So there it is. They call this the gradient, right? So since we just called, just started this, I'm going to remind you that it's called the gradient vector, all that. Now we do the dot product with the unit directional vector. So my biggest worry is when you accidentally do that on the test. So draw. This is called the unit directional vector. It must be what kind of vector? Unit. A unit vector with a length of one. one. That's longer than one. So I can divide out its Correct. magnitude. What's square root of one squared plus one squared plus negative one squared? Three. You got it? Yeah, everyone errors a unit vector in the direction of this vector. Cool. Does that make that? Yep. They call it the unit directional vector. You know which way you point it. All right, let's do this. And what are we substituting for all these x, y's, and z's? 3, 4, 5. 3, 4, 5. All right. I'm going to stick a 3 in here and stick the 4 for the y. Stick the 5 for the z. What's that first number? What do you get? There's 90 minus 12 plus 20. What is that? One ten minus twelve. Is that ninety-eight? How do you doing ninety? Oh, thirty. My bad. Thirty minus twelve plus twenty. Yeah. Is that thirty-eight? Yeah. Cool. Thank you, everyone. What's negative nine plus fifteen? Six. And what's three times four? Well, and what are we dotting this with? 1 over root 3. 1 over root 3 and negative 1 over root 3. We'll dot all this. So what's 30 38 times this plus 6 times this plus 12 times that? Um, I get 30, 42, minus 1. 41 root 3. So 38 plus 6 would be 44 over root 3. three. Well, 44 over root 3 minus, minus 12 four. over root 3 gives me 32 over root 3. You can leave it just like that. You did not have to rationalize the denominator. It didn't have units, so you can leave it like that. That's letter right. Is that what that does? But there is a B to C. So far, so good? B and C go quick, too. B. 
In which direction does V change most rapidly at P? And that's something I wanted to add to this. All right? Gradient vector is always perpendicular at the point of change. It points in the direction of increasing values. We said, well, then it also helps us to find the maximum value direction derivative. But I want one other thing. It will always, as they said here, where they ask, in which direction does V change most rapidly at P? This will be the direction that gives the maximum rate of change. It will always be in this direction as well. So let me say again. For this question, we always in the direction of the gradient vector. I should go back to the proof. What happened when I got cosine of zero? One. I got one. So I went cosine of zero, I mean, that means the angle between the two vectors would be zero degrees. So the gradient vector would always be in the direction of the actual directional vector. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I don't have to pull it up again, but remember the applet we had? There were two vectors involved. You had the gradient vector and the directional vector. We're saying, Slam those together with an angle of zero degrees, you always got that maximum rate of change. That's what happened. So this gradient vector will always provide the direction of the, in, the, uh, the steepest, steepest slope or maximum rate of change. So this is perpendicular point of change, points in the direction of increasing k values. What else can I add? It gives the what? Direction provides the direction of maximum rate of change. Okay, well, we can answer this question now. Let me read it again. 33B, in which direction does V change most rapidly at P? Letter B, I'm just going to put a vector down. What was the gradient vector? Which one of these two? The one on the left side. This part. That's all I'm going to put. It didn't say you had to make it a unit vector or anything, so here's my answer. Because it gives a direction. That's it. So again, let me be clear. The question here for letter B is, in which direction does V change most rapidly at P? In that direction. And we proved it before, but we're just saying because the cosine of zero degrees would be the angle between the directional vector and the gradient vector would be the same as the directional vector. Is uh, P like the point that was given in the, like the first part? Like That's right. Okay. And so they said, and they still wanted it at that point, and it was the same point they used earlier, this point. So very good, it was the same point they used in letter F. So this would give the maximum rate of change at that point. Cool. Now letter C, he knew this was coming. They go, what is the maximum rate of change? So this is the direction of max rate of change at that point. At the point three, four, five, I think it's at the point three, four, five. Let us see it when they go, what is the max rate of change? So we're talking magnitude, right? Yes. We're going to get the magnitude of the gradient vector at that point. It'll be a scalar value. So this answer was a vector, but here we're going to get the magnitude of that. So let's see, what do you get? I'm going to need a calculator on this one. We're going to get 8 squared plus, plus six. 6 squared plus 12 squared. Notice I didn't make it a unit vector or anything. This would give me the highest rate of change. Pretty cool. I don't know, square to some big number. We'll make sure two people get it. What's the square of 38 square plus 6 square plus 12 square? 40.298. Yeah, yeah. 40.298. After the square root? Uh, yes, or wait. Under the square, oh, I already. Oh, that's all right. Feel free to hit it. Why is this one too? Source? We really make the connection when we see these applets again. So I wanted you to see this. That color, it is green, right? Is 
that green? Okay. That green's going in the same direction as the gradient vector. What's the direction derivative value right there? Two. But if I swing this direction another way, it's going to do the dot product and get, but watch, it won't be this high. The highest value, the highest rate of change occurs when the direction vector is in the same direction as the gradient vector. That's that cosine of zero degrees, you know, being one. The maximum value of cosine. Zero degrees between the vector. So I'm just going to slide a little bit. What happens to that DUF? Does it go down? Yeah, let's go this way. Yeah, is it going down? Yep. When can I get the highest of this number right here? I'm just move my mouse around it. When, I, when can I get the highest value here? When that vector is in the same direction as the gradient vector. I just want you to see that so you know why are we answering this? We're saying that the direction that provided the max rate of change is the direction of the gradient vector. Cool. Awesome. Hey, so on that note, you all have the hill problem? I'll pop that up here. Let's do that. It's going to be very similar, but it's kind of cool. It's slightly different. I just want to make sure we work this together. So I'll keep this up here, and I'm just going to pull open. Let's see. I need that. Where's the hill? There it is. Pull that up. That'll work. So when we're standing at that blue point, everyone see that equation? 1,000 minus 0 0.005x squared minus 0.01y squared represents that graph. I made that graph with wind plot. I didn't show the whole graph. I just made sure that I wanted to zoom in on this gigantic hill. Zoom in on this hill, by the way, right there, that x-intercept would be at z equal to 1,000, right? Because x y would equal 0. Mm -hmm. So I'm taking this point right here, and that's the point 60, 40, 9, 66. Cool. So we're standing on that point blue, and we're going to talk about, you know, directional derivatives. I mean, you all can tell that when if I go in that direction, won't my slope be positive? But if I go in this direction off the point, it'll be what? Maybe. Negative. Maybe I kind of go like that. Maybe, maybe there's a way I can get the slope to be zero at some, in some direction. Well, let's go through the questions. Won't take long. So I'll swing this down. Letter A, the question is, if you walk due south, will you start to ascend or descend? Let me pull this out again. If you walk due south, so let me erase all this. If you walk due south, this is out of the way. What was Z again? 1,000. I mean, uh, the equation, F of X, Y. What was the function of X and Y? 1,000 minus, just so I can leave it on the board, 1,000 minus. 0 0.005x squared minus 0.01y squared. So it is an upside down paraboloid, right? Mm -hmm. I just took that certain portion. Letter A, they asked me about some directional derivative. Let me pull it back down again. If you walk due south, we start to ascend or descend, and they set up a break. So, but see the directions for north and south? So we're talking about, see that's the x-y axis? And I can just draw it right here. In terms of x-axis, y-axis, and when this is north, and this is south, this is east, and this is west. So the hardest part to letter A, I'm going to do a directional derivative problem, because they want us to find a rate. Don't agree? I need to find a rate. But why have you do this problem? We just did a problem. You're like, I'll be fine with this. No, we've got to do this problem as well because something tricky about this problem. They never gave you the directional derivative. I mean, they never gave you the directional vector. They just said what? Do self. So you've got to help me out. I know you can do this. Can you tell me a vector, everyone? In my image right here, that points do self, and it's got to be a unit vector. You got it. That's zero now. So in the vector we're going to use, when we do this, we go, hey, fx. Fy, we'll put that in right here. Dot, the vector we're going to use is 0, negative 1, do so. Notice it's a unit vector, but we're saying it'd be a vector with a length of 1 that way. Cool, is that right with that? What would do north be? One. 0, 1. What would do east be? 1, 0. What would do west be? Negative 1, 0. Is that what we get that? Just so this problem that there you go. Now there's one other weird one. How would you do like northeast? Can you help me figure that out? I'll try that. Northeast would be a vector that went like this. Case the problem after that. 
That would be a vector with like what? One one? Moved one this way and one that way? The only problem is that's not a unit vector. How can you make that a unit vector? Divide by square root. There you go. So there you go. So if they ever ask you like, hey, can you go northeast or something? You go, oh, okay, I'll just one over root two, one over root two. If it's like, you know, going northwest, you might need a negative on one of those. You got it. But right now we're just going to do south. What goes here? This is called the gradient. What's your respect to x? Points. Negative point one, zero, zero, one, zero, 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 we're way up at 60, 49, 66. Well, we don't have to plug the 966 in, but the x was 60, the y, 40. So I'll just plug that in here. So what do we get? So this is the directional derivative at the point 60, comma 40. And I get negative, let's put it one times 60. 0.06. Is that negative No, no, 0.6. Negative. Negative point oh one times sixty. You have to move it how many places? Two. So I need negative point zero. Negative point six. six yeah. What's negative point oh two times a forty? Is that negative point eight? Uh huh. All right. Cool. They said find the rate. What else did they ask? They want us to know if we ascend or descend. Well. Obviously, if the answer is positive, or what? Ascend. Going uphill, ascending. It's negative, we'll go downhill. What's the answer? Point eight. Yeah. And I'm going to write point eight. If you want to know units, vertical meters. Everything was in meters. Point eight vertical meters per one horizontal meter. Right? But I'm going to put ascend. Hey, B asked you to go northwest, you do something similar. You know, they go, go northwest, just for northwest. What unit vector would you use? For northwest? Yikes, what would be a vector that goes like that? Oh. Vector, what's your directional vector? Negative, Negative one, one, one. Yep. but then you got to make it a unit vector. What would root you two, use? Root two. Cool. Was that what I did with letter A? All right, letter B. Same stuff, but they go not to south, but northwest. So I'll put it right here. Negative one over root two. One over root two. I'm just curious, do we ascend or descend? What do you get? I get 0.6 over root two minus 0.8 over root two. Negative, Negative. 0.2 over root 2 vertical meters per horizontal meter, ascending or descending? Descending. Descending. Hey, I'm going to go back to the units. Just, can you tell which way it went? I'm just telling. Where would uh, Northwest be? Let me pull this down just slightly right there. It's good. Can you tell everyone? I'll hop up on this chair. <laughs> but if you went down, you know, you're going in that direction, right? There's northwest. If you're going that way, it looks like you're slightly descending. Cool. That's why I wanted you to see the image. So you can actually relate to the actual image. Right, that's just doing this problem totally fine. Cool. Hey, what's the next question? Oh, we knew this was common. In which direction is the slope the largest? Which vector? It's a 0 0.6, 0 0.8. The gradient vector, right? There's two vectors on the board right now. In which direction at that point is the slope the largest? Negative 0.6. So the direction where the slope is the largest, negative 0.6 and negative 0.8, the gradient vector. It's always in the direction of the gradient vector. And then they go, what is the rate of ascent in that direction? How can we do that? Let's get the magnitude of the gradient vector. So in this is letter C, it'd be in this direction. This would be for max rate and that's the direction, but what is the max rate? The 
maximum rate is? What? Are you kidding me? <laughs> He's right. Well, what's negative point six squared plus point eight squared? One. Right? So what we're saying would be one vertical meter per per one horizontal meter. That would be the max rate of change at that point. Go up one for one going out. Cool. Hey, uh, one more thing before we do something else. They did say at what angle does the horizontal horizontal at what angle above the horizontal does the path in that direction begin? For this. You know what we'll have to do? Can you help me out with this? I right, want max rate of change. We can tell it's just going uphill there, right? Max rate of change will be one vertical meter per one horizontal meter. One vertical meter per one horizontal meter. So if you don't mind, I'm just going to draw a picture of a triangle there. One vertical meter per one horizontal meter. Does anybody know how you can get that angle? 45 degrees. Yeah, inverse tan, I love it. Inverse tan of one. What is it? 40 what? Is that 45 degrees? Some of you knew it in your head. A 45 degree angle makes this one to one ratio there. Where this is one and that's one. So the answer to that question, everyone, let us say is 45 degrees. The question again was, at what angle above the horizontal does it path in that direction again? 45 degrees. Cool? Hey, I'll turn this off. Great job with that, everyone. Man, that was awesome. Any questions on that stuff? That's directional derivatives. You want to understand the gradient factor too? So cool things about the gradient factor. The gradient factor, I know I got summarized here, but this is just for your notes. I'll raise them and leave this up here. It provides the direction of the what? The max rate of change. It's always perpendicular at the point of tangency. It always points in the direction of increasing k values. And also, it's very helpful in finding the maximum rate, maximum value of that direction, or the maximum rate of change, which is the magnitude of the gradient factor. Cool. I love it. All right. Hey, uh, I'm looking at your practice set. I just want to make sure there's nothing that was missed. Oh, good. We did a problem like number 17. And when number 18, you see the vectors in there, you got to figure out which one's the gradient vector. I think you'll be okay with that, right? Just be careful. It points in which direction? In direction of the increasing k values. Good. Because I see a and c, and you need to determine whether it's a or c. Cool. Um, 19, they do the, if the gradient of f is this, then the fastest rate of change of f at the origin is given by, don't you just get the magnitude of that? Nice. And number 20, they want the maximum directional derivative. So once again, all you got to do is what? The magnitude of the, the gradient vector. Cool. But problems where you had to kind of work it out and find a directional derivative, you had to do that in number 16. Cool. I like I'm looking to see if there's any other ones. Oh, one more thing before we work on, we wrap up class with 14.7. There's one more thing. This gradient vector is so cool. We now have another way to get the equation of a tangent point. So here's another way to get the equation of a tangent point. So this is called, because we did equation of tangent plane in the last section, right? Does everyone agree? So you'll see this. I want to tell you what page I wrote this on. Um, this is at the bottom of page 940. This is another equation. For the equation of tangent plane, I will put in parentheses to level surface f of x comma y comma z. Do 
you notice what I'm doing? What am I using as the coefficients? Do you remember one when you had a, a plane? Which vector was the vector we always used to get an equation of, of, of a tangent plane? We always used the normal vector. Well, we just said that this vector is always what? Perpendicular at the point of tangency. So guess what we can do? As our coefficients to be x minus dx dot ef, y minus the y dot ef, z minus d dot. We can use the components of the, the gradient vector, and that's another way to get the equation of a tangent plane. So you might be sitting there going, I don't need that. I did OK in the other section. And when this is listed on page 940, if you're curious, if you want to read about it, where they wrote that, but they're talking about, this should make sense, right? This factor would be what? You know, fx, fy, fz. The normal vector. The gradient vector. But we do say two level surface. We'll say level surface like some, some, some function of x, y, and z equal to some k value. Cool. So let's work one like that. So this is like, hey, from your practice problems, this was, if you want to reference it, everyone, look at number 14 and look at number 15. <laughs> Bless you. And we'll work problems like that. Um, so I'm going to take this one from the textbook. I want to keep.